Now let me welcome you again, all of you, to the second episode of our Power to the People webinar series, which is at the same time uh, the third session of our, our unmuted series with the European Parliament. I'm Calypso Nicolaitis. I'm the co-chair of the EUI uh, STG Democracy Forum and truly honored to serve here as the face of a consortium uh, bringing together our EUI, the Friends of Kofi Group in the European Parliament, um, and a group of civil society organizations from all, of your, all over Europe, wonderful civil so society organizations, Europe Calling, Mare Democrati, Pulse of Europe, and Citizens Take Over Europe, many of whom are joining us from Porto, where, from where Nicolo is also, will field question, Nicolo being my co-chair. Um, let me just say, first of all, that this is not a one-off. Our ambition in this coalition is to help create conversations that are really trans-European in the months and hopefully years to come under this umbrella, power to the people. Whoa. Uh, and this is why we have this translation in all these languages. So I just want to remind you again of the technical points before we continue, the instructions in the chat for the interpretation, Please ask later your questions using Q&A function. And very importantly, please like your favorite questions by others too. So we can try to ask questions which get the most votes, you know, you all know what I mean. Um, and as always, this webinar is being recorded and also live stream on YouTube. So if you ask a question, your name will be read and recorded. So please keep that in mind and leave us comment on how this works for you um, later on, because we want again to repeat it. So let me now just start by saying that with all <clears throat> our hearts and minds uh, in Ukraine right now, we are meeting here to ask whether the EU is fit to fight for peace and what needs to change to ensure that it actually is. You know, we know that while we must always prepare for war when we're at peace, uh, we need to think very hard about the next peace as this war is still raging on. Um, and, and let's not forget that sadly, uh, um, alongside the Ukraine war, there are others all over the world that are taking place. So what we really want to ask is what, what actions and policies and democratic reforms needs to take place in the EU to become a, a real genuine force for peace after this conflict. Um, so, you know, the interest of this topic, perhaps unsurprisingly, is very large. We have more than a thousand registration from all over Europe and beyond for this event. Um, and we're very lucky as this happens that um, there has been a process in the EU um, which has been actually exploring this question um, before and way before the Ukraine war started in the last year. This process is called the Conference on the Future of Europe. It's a mouthful, um, but it's actually a very interesting and exciting process where politicians national parliamentarians, European parliamentarians are involved with citizens uh, to discuss these issues. And in fact, there has been 800 citizens chosen by lot, randomly chosen to take part in four citizens assembly that met um, in, in Brussels, in Strasbourg and around Europe to discuss the big issues about the future of Europe. And one of these Citizens Assembly has discussed the issue of Europe in the world and migration. And, and, and this Citizens Assembly issued a number of, a whole list of recommendations, which are now being discussed in this plenary with all the other participants in the Conference on the Future of Europe, the political people. So what we have as a basis for our conversation today is all of the recommendations that they came up with and asking ourselves, well, how does that help for Ukraine today and for the post-war in Ukraine? So, so to compress very hugely their fascinating debates and what is happening, you know, we, we've witnessed, yes, the EU has reacted very fast. Everyone is speaking about geopolitical awakening of Europe, 
But you know, the response there is not just more defense, more military capacity, but yes, it is, but we are Kantian, we are peace project, right? And so we know the limitation of military power ever since Vietnam and then Syria and then Afghanistan and da da da. So what this panel conclusions shows very well is that Europe in the world, if we want to reimagine how that happens, how the Europeans ask, we have to ask about all sorts of other areas, about energy, sustainability, strategic autonomy in trade and production, uh, how we man manage enlargement, refugee policies, all of these issues. And under our mantra, because here we're meeting as power to the people, we really, really need to ask how citizens can be brought in this conversation center stage to help set this agenda of global peace. So that's what's at stake with our discussion today and with what has hap been happening with this um, citizens uh, participation in this conference on the future of Europe uh, and in European politics. And so we're very, very lucky to have with us six wonderful speakers who will provide an impulse to our conversation. And I'll introduce them as I give them the floor. But let's just, let's just me give you a sense of, of what is coming. Uh, we will first start the conversation with two of those randomly selected citizens who were part of the citizens panel on the world and Europe, Dajana and Claudia. I'll have a short conversation with them because then they have to run to a meeting indeed of this conference on the future of Europe. And after that, we'll have a four-way conversation with Danuta and Viola, who are both politicians, members of the working group on citizens um, on uh, Europe in the world uh, in the conference, as well as two wonderful civil society activists, Alfias and Martin, uh, who have been following this process very closely. So this is our agenda today. So let's start and let me first turn to our two members of the uh, European Citizens Panel on Europe in the World, um, Dajana Milinkovic, uh, who uh, has been the deputy spokesperson and comes from Croatia, and then Claudia Derini Mazur from Poland. And, and first I want Diana and Claudia to really congratulate you for having produced all these recommendations and defending them in the plenary with great passion. It's not easy, you'll tell us more. But I also note that part of what has been going on is that you've recommended for greater citizens participation in foreign policy in Europe and the world. Can you explain today to all those listening to us why your panel found it important to stress the role of citizens? Um, and what was this most important message as citizens that you wanted to convey? So let me give you the floor to start with. Um, Diana and then Claudia. I'm afraid Calypso, they are not here yet. So we uh, need to redo this. Okay. Um, Let's continue with part two. Excellent. Well, um, as you all heard, our citizens are busy. Um, hopefully they will join us in a moment. But in the meanwhile, we are very, very uh, happy to be joined, therefore, by our two members of the European Parliament. Danuta Hoopner and Viola von Kramen, who, uh, as I was saying, were participating in the plenary on these issues alongside the citizens. Um, and so, and as well as our two civil society activists. And I'm, I'm just going to give them the floor in turn. First of all, we're gonna have two rounds of conversation and we'll see what happens if our citizens ambassadors arrive in the middle. But we will have a first round where we simply want to um, ask, what is the diagnosis? What is the problem? Um, is Europe doing its role as a peace project? And so Danuta, Danuta Hubner, you are an MEP from Poland, a member of the group, the center-right group EPP, um, very active in this group. And, and so now that um, your discussions are happening against the backdrop of the war, can, you, can I ask you from Poland, is the EU doing enough to protect Poland, Eastern Europe in general, 
against Russian aggression, against what is happening now, but also against Russian aggression in the future. Do you see that this current Ukraine war uh, shows the EU in a good light or are, and what do you think about this role of protecting you guys? Well, thank you. Thank you, Calypso, for, for getting us uh, together. And uh, you, you know very well uh, that actually the very emergence of European integration has been a major step in defending peace in Europe because we, we just grew from the ashes of the world to the fight and we knew that we have to, we cannot have any more the war in Europe. But the war is happening around the corner today and it is the, uh, the aggressor is, is Russia. The aggressor is a country, European country actually, with whom we have been having relations for decades, understanding on the assumption that uh, if we talk uh, with Russia, if we include Russia in uh, our cooperation networks, uh, then Russia is, is not an enemy, then Russia is a, a difficult, but still a friendly partner uh, to cooperate with. And then we see that it was not the right approach that the past, the history of our relations with Russia did not uh, prevent what happened um, on 24th of uh, February. And we are just faced with war, uh, with war which is uh, very close to, to Europe. And the war, which means aggression of a European country, a big European country and 44 million uh, uh, citizens, which is Ukraine, which is uh, an associated member of the European uh, Union and which is now on its way towards uh, membership. So we are having now a situation uh, that is uh, really just evolving and changing. We are waiting for the end of Europe, which, will, uh, which today is just uncertainty. And now Poland is a, is a border country, is a country that was also the first, uh, uh, the first uh, country for all the Ukrainians who were running away from uh, atrocities of Russian soldiers, and uh, they came to Poland, meaning they crossed the European uh, border. And uh, as you know, in Poland, it was this society, the civil society that took the, uh, the major responsibility for hosting um, the Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, so membership is, is definitely a, a, a step um, against the, the, the danger of, of war. Um, but then you have to look uh, into capacities of Europe to protect us, as you were uh, asking. And I think we, of course, have this famous Article 42.7, which is talking, which is a bit like, like a NATO Article 5, which is uh, obliging the, the European Union to defend um, uh, its, all its member states if they are attacked by, by, by an enemy. And we, we have used it, I think, once in, in case of France and terrorism. But that's just something which is formality. We, we are now only now actually looking into something we never appreciated enough, which is this hard power, which is the, uh, the defense uh, uh, infrastructure, defense capability. Uh, and I, I think we are, uh, the war has, has stimulated, I think, our movement in this direction. But Europe traditionally has been a, a strong uh, protector of peace through its soft powers, through globally through trade, uh, investment uh, and agreements with the entire world, uh, with uh, the single market development, which was strengthening European uh, economy, with its capacity to, um, uh, to protect democracy, which was giving uh, sort of political credibility. Uh, and we know the problems with this uh, today. Uh, and also we have been, I think, quite efficient in, in, in caring about the rules-based global architecture of, of our uh, coexistence on this uh, globe. So Europe has been using all the soft uh, power and all the instruments it had um, to, to increase its geopolitical strengths based on, first of all, on economy uh, and then on the values and the political uh, credibility. Uh, and now increasingly thinking of increasing its uh, capacities to, to, to develop security and defense uh, uh, capabilities. Mm. And Anuta, then, I, yeah. I will want to push you in a minute on, on what is to be done, what needs to be changed, how these capacities need to change, how to still use maybe the soft power, and indeed enlargement uh, being a very important dimension, as you stress too, well, is that not controversial? So all of these have to do with Europe as a peace project. And you, you are very positive, even though uh, sitting in Poland, you are really on the front line here. Um, but if you don't mind, 
before coming back to you on the on the what is to be done, I would like to to turn to Alfia Zveya, uh, who is a co-founder of Equinox Initiative for Racial Justice, um, and he's very been very active uh, in that capacity uh, and has been uh, speaking very strongly on uh, on Europe's um, limitation. So if, we, if we're gonna ask to start us with maybe contrast with Danuta's viewpoint, uh, Alfias, I'd like to hear if you're as positive as Danuta in um, when we ask, you know, what's the problem? Is there a problem with labeling Europe as a peace project? Do you see Europe as a peace project? And Alfias, please tell us where you're speaking from at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite to speak, um, especially among such a distinguished lineup of speakers and uh, into such a, uh, a wonderful audience. Um, no, really, thank you for the invitation. Um, I think, first of all, let me just say that at this moment in time, we have to really show our solidarity with the people in Ukraine, um, those in border um, in neighboring countries like Poland and other places that have shown such solidarity with with the Ukrainian people who are leaving. And you know, we should do everything we can to, to fight this, this menace that we're seeing in our neighborhood. Where I disagree um, with the previous speaker, and I've worked in the European Parliament for over eight years and worked quite closely on, on EU foreign policy, is our approach and the, the, the merits of EU soft power. Um, as a racialized person, I, you know, um, having not always been around that, you know, policy making Brussels bubble. I have a lot more criticisms in terms of how that soft power actually works and, and, and looks. Um, and, you know, um, what I would say in my first line of thought is that, you know, the threat we're facing today from President, uh, from Putin and Russia um, is something that we in racialized communities have been talking about for years, uh, far right nationalism, fascism, you know, and, you know, we, let's not forget that you know Putin's petro dollars were supporting you know the likes of uh, Orban, um, you know when he was going against rule of law and other things um, in in Hungary and you know other far right uh, political parties in Europe. You know we're seeing it with uh, Le Pen in France. So you know we've been warning about this problem for so long, but yet no one actually took notice of us, you know, complaining about this problem saying that, you know, there's a big problem in Europe, you know, with fascism, you know, with the support of Putin, you know, in, in Russia for some political, for some governments, for some political parties, you know, the anti-LGBTI uh, laws that we're seeing, you know, pop up in, in many EU member states, you know, that originated in, um, in Russia. Um, so, you know, we've been warning about this problem for a long time. And what I would say is EU policy is rather reactive and is not proactive. Uh, policy is neither consistent or coherent. And I would say EU soft power has been undermined by its own actions and by its own member states for, for, for many years. You know, uh, today we're talking about Ukraine, but, you know, EU member states, you know, um, have, you know, engaged in their own Western imperialism, you know, and just look what's happening in Yemen, you know, one of our biggest allies, the Saudis, um, you know, what, what are they doing in Yemen? And, you know, so when we're talking about EU soft power, it can only work if it's consistent and coherent. And so having, you know, su supporting, you know, autocratic governments in other parts of the world doesn't do anything for our soft power, more or less also, violations by EU member states of fundamental rights and rule of law. And the previous speaker comes from Poland. We see what's been happening, you know, by, uh, by law and justice and Kaczynski. But, you know, across Europe, we're seeing, you know, not, not only the far right, but, you know, centrist, uh, uh, center left, center right, political parties, governments engaging, you know, in violations of fundamental rights. So how can we be a credible actor and a promoter of peace globally when, you know, in our own borders, we are, you know, engaging in the same kind of, you know, engaging in violations of fundamental rights in targeting particular groups, cracking down on, you know, uh, freedom of media, freedom of expression. Um, and so we're seeing this. And, you know, if you look at EU foreign policy, human rights are regularly traded for economic privileges with third countries. Um, you know, and uh, one of the interesting things, you know, I'm doing a lot, a lot of work around just transition and, and the environmental climate crisis is this idea that, you know, we're going to swap Russian gas or Russian oil for, you know, Saudi or Qatari oil or gas. 
you know, um, how does that make any sense, you know, in our pursuit of human rights and fundamental rights across the world? You know, like for me, I, th I think what well, we need to have a realistic conversation about consistency and coherence in policy, you know, and, and what I found interesting as a racialized person, and I, I'll end here, is that, you know, when we talked about, you know, when at, when at the beginning of the crisis, you saw these reporters and politicians engaging in this horrible racist narrative that, you know, how is it happening to, you know, white Europeans who should be welcoming them? I would just say, but I mean, you know, this is, this is completely consistent with what communities like mine have been seeing. Because, you know, if you look at, you know, the way we deal, you know, in the same forest, you know, uh, from Belarus to Poland, Syrians were freezing to death. And let me remind you, they were freezing to death from bombs that Putin was providing in Aleppo. So, you know, what I would say is where's the consistency in the policy? If we want to be a serious actor for peace, and I'm a committed Europhile, and I really, really am, you know, passionate, I worked in the European Parliament, but we have to be consistent in order to, you know, be a, a true promoter of peace and a credible actor globally. And, you know, if we want to be serious with third countries about human rights violations, we have to make sure that we're fixing our own problems in our own countries, because then it doesn't seem like we're politicizing human rights. It seems that, you know, we are generally trying to commit, uh, trying to promote human rights across the world and promote democracy, rule of law and human rights. And indeed, Alfie, in a second round, I want to come back to you exactly on this question, because you're clearly at a different place on the spectrum than Danuta. To our question, uh, is the EU fit to fight for peace? And I just want to respond, first of all, to questions out there that um, I'm getting that are we talking about the EU or Europe? Well, we are talking about the EU, but of course, the EU is the institutional, is the organization that acts for Europe, although, of course, the member states too act for Europe. But today, we're trying to really ask about the EU, the union, and what more can it do? Is it fit? Clearly, Alfias, your diagnosis is, well, if you're addicted, you're not very fit. If you're addicted to oil, whether you get it from Russia or Saudi Arabia, you're not very fit. If you are capable of treating people diametrically opposed who are in a different way, who are at knocking at your borders, if they're from Ukraine or if they were from Syria or anywhere else in the world, maybe you're not fit. And it will be interesting to hear what others have to say about this. Um, so you've painted the picture that is very demanding and we will ask what is to be done. Um, but before that, I would like now to turn to Varela von Krammen. Uh, Varela, you are an MEP for the Greens uh, from Germany. Um, and, and so we know that your, your group is very active in the European Parliament on foreign policy and that you've been a member of this uh, working group on Europe in the world. So please um, give us your diagnosis before we move on to, to prescriptions. What is your diagnosis on whether Europe is ready and fit to fight for peace? Yes, thank you, Calypso, and thanks to everyone. Uh, well, if you don't mind, I take the liberty to speak in German while I see that many questions are in German and that the long list of uh, Ashley uh, attendees uh, are German, so it might be easier than have this uh, cross interpretation. Um, also, ich meine, das ist die Idee der Europäischen Union und das hat ja sowohl Danuta als auch Calypso betont. Die Idee ist, einen stabilen Frieden äh, in Europa durch die Europäische Union zu schaffen. Also damit haben wir vielleicht auch schon eine dieser Fragen beantwortet. Ja, die Europäische Union ist nicht Europa, aber die Europäische Union sorgt hoffentlich dafür, dass zum Beispiel Frieden und Stabilität und eben auch andere Werte, ähm, die Alfias eben zu Recht ähm, eingeklagt hat und die nicht unbedingt immer ausreichend berücksichtigt werden, auch ähm, ja, rechtlich äh, besser verankert sind. Also das heißt, das, was im Moment in der Ukraine passiert, können wir nicht verhindern, konnten wir nicht verhindern, weil wir, obwohl es seit Jahrzehnten ähm, ähm, Dialogangebote gibt, ähm, Möglichkeiten ähm, für, äh, also Richtung Russland gab, die Hand auszustrecken, ähm, 
versucht wurde, Russland ökonomisch einzubinden, gerade insbesondere in Deutschland, ähm, auch immer gedacht hat, die, die Politikerinnen und Politiker die gedacht haben, und, und wenn es die ökonomischen Verflechtungen gibt, um, dann sind wir in einer gegenseitigen Abhängigkeit that, um, und kein we have all this economic, Staats- oder Regierungschefs uh, oder so diesen wir sind, sich selbst wirtschaftlich schaden. Aber and ich glaube, alle, die sich ein bisschen länger mit Europa beschäftigt haben, uh, the consequences. Second, uh, for a second, so, sorry, may I interrupt you are for we, a second? Are we okay with the translation? I'm hearing I'm, that there might be some, some I'm, issues. Are we okay? Um, English words. Max, uh, okay, okay, please. So I'm sorry. Let's uh, let's start. Uh, let's continue. I'm so sorry about this interruption. That's no, fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. I just thought because I saw the the names oh, of no, the no. attendees, and no, they're no, mainly it's, Germans, it's, it's and it would fine. be crazy if I speak in English while everyone speaks actually German no. and understands German. No, no, that's okay. perfect. <laughs> Gut, also mein Punkt, mein, mein Punkt ist, right. dass so, ähm, wir diesen Krieg is that, ähm, in dieser Form uh, und in dieser Brutalität, uh, einige haben ihn vorhergesehen uh, und einige haben gewarnt war, und einige uh, haben auch gesagt, brutality, ähm, lasst uns with its quasi form, strategisch uh, well, uns darauf einrichten, dass das kommt. Uh, Aber viele uh, der Fragen, die jetzt im Chat waren, das heißt, kann man nicht einfach sich hinsetzen und mit Putin einen Dialog suchen und eine Verhandlungslösung finden. Das wollte man einfach negotiate a, a solution because if you want to negotiate something you need both parties to sit around the same table glaube, eines ist and klar, find a solution so there was no willingness to do so eines Putin. So on the one hand uh, we have a sovereign stellen. state uh, which is Ukraine wir, and this should not be put into question in of course um, wir we in Germany mit dem uh, with the second world war and so with the first Unheil world war we have been Creating in so Ländern, much suffering. Belarus, uh, and Ukraine, if I Poland, now look at the uh, uh, Belarus, so if I look at the Baltic Tote state, and um, I, I see that so many millions of people have died uh, because of that. So we as Germans, of course, have to live up to our responsibilities from an historical point of view. And I think we now have the duty to do everything in our power and in order to uh, make sure das ist das, was die something similar happens again, because this is what is, is, das ist jetzt is expected ein losgelöst von dem, was by the, the Ukrainians. And Calypso beforehand asked, how can the EU make sure that there is peace in Europe? Das ist eine sehr abstrakte und eine sehr Frage im Moment, of course, this can be understood as a very abstract question, because we are currently in the midst of a war. So again, we should ask ourselves, what can Europe do, given the current tools that we have available, to prevent uh, the, the war. As I said, we, we visited uh, Ukraine recently, and a colleague of ours uh, was, was, was there uh, today, so we are in constant contact, of course, with the colleagues that are there in Ukraine, and we are really trying to cater for the needs of the Ukrainians that, that, that comes first, of course, and of course, it is very difficult to carry a debate and to increase their defense capacity. Second aspect, um, of course, we have to create a future for them. And um, I know the Baltic states very well, and I know out of experience that there is no fast track uh, procedure, so there is no accelerated accession mechanism. Uh, so again, we're getting the first replies from President Zelensky, and that was about a very normal accession procedure. And, um, and um, of course, uh, we would like to, to see an accelerated accession uh, process as it would be the case with the Baltic States. And then there's a second aspect. We were able to react quite swiftly, and we did so in a very united way, but that is not enough, because we want to make sure that sanctions 
are very heavy so that they will generate a political change in Moscow. Uh, so that, that's, that's what we, we expect. And then there is a fourth aspect, uh, which is humanitarian hate. Things are going very well in this regard. And uh, somebody, uh, some people have criticized the way in which humanitarian aid is being provided. Uh, some, a lot of Ukrainians have left the country. And of course, they can rely on the help of uh, European citizens. So this is, in general, again, it is working fine because, again, Europeans are ready to, to host uh, the refugees. As I said, um, the situation was, was criticized and um, the, the criticisms went into the following direction, of course, when refugees came from Syria, nobody wanted to host them and now things have changed because these are Ukrainians. And then we have to think about the future, how to rebuild Ukraine after the war. And das wird nachhaltig sein, das wird natürlich mit verschiedenen äh, multilateralen Institutionen passieren etc. Pp. Grundsätzlich würde ich einfach nur gerne festhalten wollen, dass mit der Aggression, mit dem imperialistischen Revanche-Verhalten, das Putin an den Tag legt, mit der Leugnung, dass es eine ukrainische Nation, einen ukrainischen Staat gibt, mit der Ansage, alle Ukrainerinnen und Ukrainer and, vernichten zu wollen, weil sie sich als Ukrainerin of, of course, bezeichnen, ist es uh, unglaublich schwierig, wirklich mit very difficult to deal with the current uh, situation and it is very difficult ist gut, to make progress in terms of negotiations. So again, uh, we would like again to have a, a, a decision in the European Parliament by majority uh, in order to help the Ukrainians as they wish to be helped. Thank, thank you, Viola. Um, this this is a very big list of asks for the EU, um, and as you stressed, um, it's it's fine to to promise membership, as Danuta and you stressed. But on the other hand, it doesn't happen overnight. So we're trying to look at all the ways in which the EU might be fit for peace, uh, and and to to be to build peace and to fight for peace. Um, and you stressed also the difficulty in, in receiving humanitarian aid and, and our, the problem of double standards, we will need to rebuild Ukraine. We will want to pursue the question of whether this conference on the future of Europe, this process of reform we're seeing now is accelerating. It's, is Europe up for this crazy task, a hugely demanding task? And, and before we go into more detail on how it can do that, I'd like to turn to Martin Speer. You're, of course, a well-known European civil society voice, Martin, and you um, you won a, a big prize for your um, action. You with Pulse for Europe, you you have this project on home parliaments, um, and you wrote a recent piece uh, that also stressed some of these issues. But I'd like you to perhaps just now react to what the other speakers said in terms of the diagnosis before we move on to what is to be done. And in any language that you would like, I think. Um, but there might be an issue with uh, with German right now. Um, so, floor is yours, Martin. Martin, I'm not sure we can hear you. Europa ist die EU wirklich self um, you have a lot of 
analysis and pieces that really show that the EU and the member states aren't um, basically capable of protecting their citizens or protecting um, the political unit EU uh, without the help um, of the US. And I was very moved by a statement of Annegret kram karrenbauer who was former Minister of Defense in Germany. And basically she said, and that's now a quote, uh, without America's nuclear and conventional capabilities, Germany and Europe cannot protect themselves. So those are the plain facts. Um, I think the stage we are in right now is this huge transformative shift from realizing we've been a super, I think, strong soft power force in the world, but we aren't really able to um, also defend our way of living, uh, the rule of law, democracy, freedom, and uh, minority rights, also with hard power instruments. And I think that's majorly because we, member states as well as citizens, um, looked away or avoided this controversial discussion on, 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 on defense capabilities, who's deciding, who's spying, um, uh, uh, what kind of strategy are we are uh, following. And um, I think a major um, block that is ahead of us that has to be overcome um, is not only the question, is it really realistic that we keep 27 different armies, that we do all those individual buyings of weapons on a national level, and, and, and who's having the command of those armies in, in case of such an emergency, basically, with seeing right in our neighboring uh, region. Um, and another line of thought I was having is the cultural dimension of all of it, because I'm, I'm a citizen and I'm, I honestly, I was part of all those citizens probably that thought that the European model could survive and spread all over the world without us truly standing up for it. So all those un uncomfortable questions of how far are we willing or how far would we go to defend um, uh, the European way of life, um, I think I, I, as many probably avoided that question. And I also voted following that way of thinking that this isn't really needed. Um, so yeah, we have a lack of military um, um, power coordination. Uh, we're doing too many, um, 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 or we're answering too many questions on um, uh, security in like from a national perspective. And I think on, on the side of us citizens, we, need to, we also need a cultural shift from accepting uh, that we um, have to um, um, protect and um, defend our way of life also with hard power instruments. Martin, that's a big agenda. Um, perhaps we should ask together whether um, <laughs> it's always the right thing to say we have a European model because the rest of the world is listening and wonders whether, you know, just because we have maintained peace on our continent, you know, we haven't always done so in the rest of the world, as Alfias was reminding us, um, not only in the faraway past of, of, of traditional colonialism, but Europe has been involved in all sorts of wars. Um, and it's not always the case that the world thinks they should just use Europe as a, as a model. So, uh, but nevertheless, Europe can be an inspiration. Europe can be a force for trying to think again about how we have a, a global order that is more peaceful. And indeed, uh, uh, and, and Martin, I, I, I want to turn again to you in, in a moment because now we, we really want to get into the, the weeds, the concrete proposals. Uh, what is really to be done? And, and of course, Danuta and Viola are part of this group which is producing proposals. Um, but um, at the same time, um, all of us are, are watching. Uh, we want to understand what 
what this process of reform is coming up with very concretely. It seems to me reading in detail um, all of these documents that you've proposed is that a lot rests on this very um, difficult concept of strategic autonomy that Europe needs to be more autonomous. Martin was just saying, you know, well, we rely too much on the US, but we also for nuclear or conventional, but also we rely too much on obviously on Russia, but on anyone else in the world for our energy. So there are a number of proposals there that have to do with autonomy, uh, strategic or not, and that have to do with trade in that way. So it would be interesting to hear more from you. And there are some questions that are coming in this direction. How do you do uh, autonomy um, in this world? Is that, is that the way in which we can better fight for peace if we're more autonomous? Um, so uh, who would like to take the floor? And, and perhaps Nicolo, um, before I turn to our four speakers, um, can I ask you if you want to uh, convey some more questions here? Sure. Looking at the looking at the questions in the list, I mean they they build on what you just um, raised, Calypso. The the most popular question he, in this list is about uh, actually the relationship with the USA. Um, so that touches on on strategic autonomy of the European Union, and and indeed Karen in the uh, questions here even suggests that the war in Ukraine may be in some ways a proxy war of the US with Russia. So there's a, there's a question about EU relations with uh, the US. Uh, and also in the questions, uh, several questions from Christia, from Je Jenny, from Wolfgang are about the future of Russia. Um, and isn't Russia also Europe? Um, okay, we said we're talking about the European Union, but there's a question about uh, what, is, what is Europe? Some people suggesting Russia's also Europe, that there's not gonna be any stability in Europe without dramatic Russia, Russian reforms without a post-Putin Russia. Um, so what should the EU strategy be with regards to Russia and democratic transition potentially in Russia? Those would be the two questions so far. Thank you, Nicolo. So we have, we have the East and the West, the West and the East of Europe and our, um, both the autonomy, some autonomy with the US, but still co cooperating, how you do that, uh, but also Russia. Russia is not just the enemy. Russia is part of that Europe we're looking to for the future. So who would like to take on this, uh, these questions? Um, perhaps should I turn Alfias? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my, my, my point would come to, you know, what is the solutions here? And I, and I think, you know, we need to have a, um, we need to think of, you know, what is the solutions here? And, and I, I would be, looking at a few different points. I think, you know, the approach has to be authentic and universal. Universal. So I, I saw some comments about European values and stuff. It's about international values. Uh, it's about international human rights standards. It's about always going from the international perspective. And I think moving away from this American and European exceptionalism, I spent a lot of time in the US. I've done fellowships there. I've, I've done. A, I spent a lot of time in Congress and Senate. And, you know, pushing back against this idea of this American European exceptionalism, which often actually in the end creates more problems. I think we should, you know, we created, we helped to build this, you know, multilateral order after World War II. So why are we not actually investing in that and using that as our basic, as our as our starting point in terms of our policy approach? You know, uh, let's move away from you know European values. Let's talk about you know the the international instruments and what we've created. And in terms of the US, um, you know. The, the Trump administration shows us, you know, the problems with becoming too reliant on America. We didn't have a trusted partner for four years. You know, we had a person in, uh, who was president that, you know, who was actively trying to undermine the EU and, you know, working with enemies of the EU, EU to undermine the EU's own safety and questioning the EU and supporting, you know, the Brexiteers in the UK and stuff. So I think, you know, we have to also see how we can stick to this international framing, but also, you know, um, focus from a European perspective and, you know, not, not become too reliant on the US because uh, the four years of the Trump presidency actually undermined the multilateral institutions, the UN and other, other institutions, you know, significantly. And, you know, actually gives a license to other countries, third countries to do the same. You know, when they see the country that 
you know, was the one directly involved in creating these great institutions, you know, the Bretton Woods institutions, that, you know, these is that, you know, that country goes away from them. And then I think we also have to understand that we're living in a changing world. It's a demographic change. You know, 20, the world in 2100 will be very different. You know, the youth of the world are in Africa. You know, what is our positioning with countries in Africa? You know, what is our migration policy? And, you know, this idea to keep out black and brown migrants, you know, how does that, how's that going to help us to build allies, you know, with countries that, you know, will, will eventually become, you know, superpowers. Nigeria, you know, will be a superpower by 2100, you know, how are we thinking about this long-term vision? And what I would say here, one of the solutions is that, you know, EU policymaking is not inclusive, you know, the institutions aren't diverse, neither is the consultation process, and that's not just of ethnic or minorities or other margin, marginalized minorities like LGBTQI people, people with disabilities, but, you know, with people from, you know, different backgrounds, you know, from, uh, with, you know, with our citizens, our constituents that the institutions represent, these institutions, and I work there, and, you know, they are a little bit aloof and, you know, the meritocratic system that we have, you know, at the EU level in terms of the civil service and stuff like this is a bit aloof from the reality of the people on the ground and the conference on the future of the Europe tries to rectify that but then you know the work we've seen with the conference on the future of Europe, you know, it's not inclusive at all, you know, people from marginalized backgrounds aren't, you know, involved in, 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 in putting together those recommendations. So, you know, that's why you come up with some very weird recommendations or some very dangerous recommendations if you see the panel on migration. So what I would say is that, you know, we need to have a complete shakeup of, you know, the, the, the policy making and making it more inclusive. So the constituents, the people that we serve, from uh, as working in these institutions, whether it's the MEPs, civil servants, or whoever else, that you know we're actually representing our constituents and we're actually taking on board their concerns. And you know that's the only way. And I, I believe the only way the EU will be a force for peace is if we can convince our own citizens in 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 in, in the belief of in in the EU. And to do that, we need to rebuild trust. And the only way we can do that is by actually actively reaching out to them and bringing them bo on board with you know our policy making and for me that means it has to be a complete rejig of the way the institutions operate right now including the 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 recruitment uh, um i will really end here but the meritocratic yes. system that we have in place right now leads us to a group of people making decisions or, or articulating policy visions that is not reflective, but you know, is also a little bit aloof because you know it's that these people are based in Brussels, have gone to top uh, top universities, and you know are, are trying to influence policy making, but you know don't have the real experience or aren't in tune with the citizens. So I think you know we really need to look at you know how who's making the policy making, how we're we making it more inclusive, and you know really rebuilding trust in our in our in the EU. So then we can become a force for good in the in the in the world stage, and you know we can start to you know rebuild trust globally in the multilateral institutions that we created post World War II, and also be ready for the change that's coming. You know we're talking about Russia today, but by twenty one hundred, oh, yeah. the world could look very I different. I ask you to yeah. include. Sorry, sorry, Alf, yes, but we um, we have everyone wanting to jump on board and 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 react to what you've said, uh, which is very interesting. Um, and just for those who are listening and who were wondering what Alfias was um, talking about when he said weird recommendations on migration, linking it to the fact that Alfias seems to believe that the this conference is not inclusive enough. The EU as a whole is not inclusive enough in terms of different variety, diversity of citizens involvement and the type of citizens but he would he stresses the fact that this is also reflected in how this conference um, is composed in and this these recommendations on migration just so people understand are more on the kind of the control side even um, saying we have to fight against illegal migration even talking about repatriation rather than on the kind of the welcoming side that is a uh, perhaps more of the sensitivity that Alfias is kind of channeling and plugging into here. So it would be very interesting to, um, but you're making a more general point that, you know, international order, we kind of helped create it. Now, I mean, Danuta and Viola and then Martin, but um, just simply turning to my uh, Danuta and Viola because you're in, in the middle of this mm -hmm. process of generating, um, uh, generating recommendations. 
Uh, and indeed, yes. some of these recommendations are very different from the world trade order, free trade, etc. No, we need to make trade conditional. So is that the new order that Alfias is talking about? What, what would you pull out, Danuta, of your from your recommendations? Do you agree with Alfias' point or do you want to push back and, and give us your recommendations? Well, you, you know, I'd like to, first of all, to, to react to this criticism because I mean, we all can just list hundreds of, I can myself do it, hundreds of weaknesses of the European Union, and we have been actively as European Parliament. Before that, I was in the Commission, we have been actively always, all the institutions are very actively involved in the process of change, because Europe is all the time around change. But I would say, I, I wouldn't say just leave aside European values and let's talk about the world, because I think European values are indeed Europe, universal values. Give me an example of European value that wouldn't be a universal value. And I think it is extremely important that we remember about the values because the union is just based on them. And without and this is the values and how we implement them that is making us uh, credible. And also talking about the there's no consultation, that there's no basically democracy, there's union is not inclusive. I could also give you hundreds of examples of inclusiveness, of uh, consultations that you know every legal act or every action by the commission cannot move forward without the consultation that we have, the whole processes of impact assessment. We have the whole processes of uh, involving the citizens already since I think Lisbon Treaty was also European Citizens Initiative, very badly functioning. We have to change. It, but there is, a, there are a lot of efforts of European conventions, debates for years. So we cannot just say, uh, just just dismiss everything that Europe has created so far and say everything is bad. I think we, I, I cannot find any other example in the world of a, a unity of 27 states and 450 million people, or much more if you take association and European economic area of people just sticking together, seeing common interests. Of course, there is the question of competences. We don't, union has limited competences. There is the question of very weak internal mechanism towards governments that are basically populist and anti-European being members of European uh, Union and do things like the Polish or Hungarian governments. And we have very weak mechanism to fight uh, against that. There is this disaster of the uh, Belarusian border, which is to a certain extent due to the fact that the member state has to invite Frontex to come and intervene, which is just madness, I think. Frontex should intervene as, as institution immediately. So there is a lot of things we have to fix, and that is the conference uh, about. And I'm extremely happy that we finally managed to convince some uh, uh, sort of uh, who are still politicians who were very hesitant about the conference that we need to, to add to this European Union, which is a democratic construct, but based on the system of representative democracy, that we can strengthen it with the participatory democracy, and that we finally have this uh, conference. And you will never be happy with the representativeness of the delegation of the European citizens. But when I was watching citizens, actually, the, the engagement growing in with the conference, and if you read the 178 um, the recommendations just coming from the four panels, plus more than 300, I think, from national conventions, plus the organized civil society uh, world, which, by the way, is also part of transparency procedure in European Union, uh, which is also, I think, part of our uh, democracy. I think the, the conference really delivered much more than, than, than I personally expected, even though I am normally optimistic on those things. And I'm extremely happy that, in, that we could see among the citizens also understanding that you cannot just, even if we had uh, 10, uh, 10 working groups and four panels and different topics that we cannot see a, a look at those issues in a silos way. It's all really today, everything is linked to everything else. And that's why in this group where I was uh, participating on the Europe in the, in the world, we could clearly see how everything comes together. And we could see that uh, only the way we act on our internal issues can give us this credibility to be effective also externally in the global world. And, and that was really very sort of uh, important to, uh, to see. And also I could- In a way, I, I, Danuta, you're, yeah. back to, you're back to Afia's point about consistency between how Europe is inside, how inclusive, and its credibility vis-a-vis -vis the rest of yeah. the world. Yeah. Understanding that the global South in particular you know, uh, doesn't always um, trust the EU uh, and has been on the fence in
Anutan, and um, I think it's uh, just want to tell all the speakers to speak a bit slower for the interpreters. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and and, um, and and maybe I, I want to ask Martin uh, to react to Danuta's um, uh, point um, and then turn to Viola and then turn back to you, Danuta, before, before yeah. we close, before you have to go. Um, uh, Martin, I mean, the, the, yeah. Danuta was covering a lot of grounds. She did, you, you, she did have another point of convergence with Alfias. You didn't seem to be very happy, Danuta, with what happened at the Bielorus border. It's a disaster, absolutely. Frontex. Yeah, so that's the one area where you're not quite as adamant in defending EU institutions. Here we're talking about Frontex. You don't like what happened at that border. I so am extremely critical about thousands of issues. I was just as I was trying to say that we have to see that we are integrating 27 member states and those 500 million people. But of course, we are in the process of improving uh, Europe, making it better. And we have a lot of things which have to be fixed and changed. And there are many examples uh, that he gave, which I could even add to them many more. And I fully agree with, with examples he, he, he said, but I would just draw different conclusions from this. Absolutely. And so, Martin, many things to change. So now we turn to you. And what are those things that need to be changed very concretely and specifically now? Yeah. I mean, first of all, before I dive into like three concrete ideas, I want to uh, thank uh, Afias and Danuta. And I, I would say that when asking, can we be a coherent and consistent power of peace? Maybe the reality is, no, we can't. So Europe is like the perfection of imperfection. It's constantly changing and that's how it is. But should, us, should this prevent us from moving forward? No. Um, so I think we like reality and Ukraine shows us is so rough, so fast that we have to like improve on the outside while at the same time improve on the inside. And it's a thing that has to happen at the same time. That makes it so hard to communicate. That makes it so hard to make it happen. So heads up to Danuta and Viola in the parliament and the work you're doing. I think, you know, as a citizens to say, do this to that is always easy Then to implement it and to fight it through is like quite a tough job these days. Um, but maybe um, to go back to your initial questions on like concrete things we could do. Um, I think Danuta made a really important point when it comes to like external borders, like the Polish external border is also the external border of Germany or France. So why aren't we handing over step-by-step step the responsibility for EU external borders completely to uh, reformed Frontex including parliamentary, parliamentarian control. Um, I note that you, Martin, you say reformed Frontex because Danuta would not want a non-reformed Frontex. These I, are yeah. the, for everyone on the call. These are the, the border guards the, and, and others around them who manage sometimes, who, or rather help supposedly the member states manage the external borders if there are member states with external borders. But that relationship between the national border machinery and the EU Frontex machinery is, is actually controversial and difficult as we're hearing. So right. here is Martin's first proposal handover, but to a reformed Frontex. So we- Yeah, and also involving first. the parliament more in controlling Frontex and making sure that you know, we heard a lot of controversial things about how Frontex is, is doing what they're doing and how much we know about it. Um, I think secondly is we have to talk more seriously and consider the creation of EU armed forces. I was honestly very surprised when Borrell, so the high representative for foreign affairs was uh, like showing to the world the EU rapid reaction force with 5,000 uh, people, while at the same time saying, you know, it's not about creating a European army. I think um, that that's a mistake. We need this discussion and maybe creating it as a 28th army. So additional to the national armies and then step-by-step step, including them into this 
European force. And another, and maybe these are the two final thoughts, uh, proposal is that a newly created EU Foreign and Security Council that includes members of the Parliament, of the Council, and the Commission could be in charge basically of this uh, armed forces and make it possible, possible that they um, that this is the place where get their where, where they get their orders from. And maybe to conclude, because I was talking like in the first statement about the cultural dimension. So also as citizens realizing, okay, we're turning into a second stage of European integration history. It's not only about internal peace, it's also about external peace, that maybe an EU civil service could really help to bring young Europeans together, but also linking them to you know, what it means to be a European citizen. It's not only about getting rights, but also you know, giving, giving back to the community. And maybe the Ukraine war is also like a wake up call or could be the rebirth of the idea of a European civil service that was proposed many times throughout European integration history, but maybe it's time to bring this back. And I think formats like this and what we're doing here, what home parliaments is doing, what citizens take over for Europe is doing is crucial and will become even more important in the next month when uh, Europe is going through this big uh, uh, period of transition. Martin, I'm glad you, you, I mean, these are, thank you for these proposals, which are very specific and concrete. And I would like to hear Viola's reaction to them and how they chime Viola with the um, recommendations that you've been discussing in the, in the parliament and in the COFI. Let me just point to, to perhaps something, a logic that Martin is, is suggesting to us is that here's Martin saying in this moment of awakening, we need to do more things at the European level, even whether it's managing our borders together, whether it's creating some embryo of a European army more than the small rapid reaction force, whether it's a, really a civil service. Um, so more together, more and more, but at the same time, this more needs to be anchored uh, in more citizens understanding and participation and impact. So going down. So as you go up, you go down. That's what kind of you're saying. The fr Frontex needs to be controlled by the European Parliament, but maybe also citizens. Citizens need to be involved one way or another. So partly what I'd love for us to kind of push here is as we say, well, Europe should do more of this and that in the world is to fight for peace. What is the role of the citizens there? You can't go up without going down. Um, so Viola, what, what's, what are your thoughts on these proposals and on this logic that we're moving towards? Well, thank you so much for the, for the question and also uh, for, for the comments and remarks by each and everyone and also by Martin now. Um, I think that was the whole idea of uh, this conference for the future of Europe. Uh, I mean, to have a better um, taste, a better feeling, a better inspiration on what is going on, not just on the political level, in the different national levels, on, or as, as Danuta has said, the civilized, uh, organized civil uh, society, but also on the citizen level. And this exercise of uh, the conference of um, uh, for the future of Europe, I think, was a good test case for bringing together different levels, having like uh, different topics, cluster, involving citizens, involving um, uh, different target groups, involving national parliaments, but also us as uh, members of the European Parliament. And um, in the end, and that's what we are heading for, having the final proposals, which are more or less binding, and then being them implemented in the, let's say, executive level. Um, I would say that was, or still is, is not an easy task for different reasons, why we had no experience how to steer this process, why not everyone had the same political will to be a constructive force within this uh, exercise, so to say, and some were 
rather, um, let's say, um, obstructive uh, than constructive. And uh, some said, like, I think Emmanuel Macron started the whole process and then let it go, not really uh, participated, not in any way, and probably will take over after he will be re-elected. So the whole thing was a bit, in German, we would say, for Asho, yeah? So in, in one way, I really liked the concept. We were really in favor. Daniel Freund, our representative in this uh, executive board, is one of the heaviest lobbyists for this concept of uh, the future of Europe. But in the end, let's say the daily business and the practice, how it was conducted and how it was managed by the EU institution and especially by the council, is not something you really would like to repeat in terms of efficient um, uh, uh, use of, of resources, of your personal resources, but also on, on, I would say, financial resources. So yes, I would say we, we need a standardized routine on this. I wish we could find an institutionalized a uh, way of how we involve more citizens uh, uh, concerns uh, also what um, the, the example Martin has given um, Frontex is a good example where we could have more oversight from citizens from civil society uh, from I don't know parliaments of course in a in a manner which would benefit each and everyone and we, in our proposals here from this uh, working group, uh, EU in the world, I think there are concrete proposals which could be easily adapt and which exactly, uh, let's say, have this in and outside view on trade, on environment, on raw material, on resilience, on security, and so on. But can in you, the end... Ola, can you just mention yeah. one or two, just so we have a good sense, and especially with your green sensitivity here. You know, if you had to pull out one proposal that you want to really champion and see happen. Well, I mean, for example, for example, the, the, the third proposal is defining standards within and outside the EU in trade and investment relations. I mean, that is what the EU does. But the objective is we propose that the EU strengthen the ethical dimension of its trade and investment relation through. And then we come with uh, five, I would say, rather progressive uh, proposals in terms of how this should look like. And you really can feel the citizens' approach of, for example, uh, sustainable development, human rights standards, including workers' and trade union rights, offering certification of products, abiding by EU legislation, engaged in an EU-wide dialogue process, that seeks to inform and educate on environmental and ethical efforts, policy changes in international trade. So this is much more in advance than anything else we had so far on the European level. And I wish we could just take these proposals almost one to one and try to get those implemented in a trial law. But as I said, I mean, that is a lot of work from a lot of people and many put a lot of, in German, I would say Herzblut. Yeah, really, I mean, your love and your inspiring thoughts into this. But I'm not so sure whether our beloved, uh, let's say, head of states <laughs> are so happy with this. And I mean, speaking about Orban and all the other bus heads, um, I mean, they would just burn it. Yeah. So it is, and now I come back to Danuta, when we speak about realpolitik, it is a question of what is he, uh, egg and what is hen. So we have to create an environment where those proposals find a realistic chance to be implemented. But for this, we need a reconstruction of the decision-making process. And with uh, the council in the lead, nevertheless, it will be extremely difficult to start this process. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, maybe somebody has a better idea, but I'm still after getting all the information, how this process was uh, being um, um, steered or governed uh, by the steering board. I'm not too optimistic. And well, I know that, sorry, please go ahead. Um, no, but you're not too optimistic because in the, in the end, all the roads bring us back to democracy and to the question of, well, you know, you're making rather radical proposals in this 
context with the citizens, using trade as a bigger leverage. You say the ethical dimension, the environmental dimension. So we use our market to leverage change outside that is important for global peace. There are but issues this about this. So, but you're saying it, you don't think it's going to happen. So we want to. No, Sorry. no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm fighting for this. This will need to be happen because if we speak of any kind of, let's say, energy transition, if we speak of uh, um, uh, mobility, mo mobility transition, so we need to change things in a uh, paramount amount of, of, let's say, sectors. And if we think our dependency on raw material, be it uh, oil and gas on Russia, but also other materials, lithium and others, we need to find a sustainable way how to deal with third countries and to prevent uh, this social disparity, exploitation of people. We have to go a different path. And these are realistic, I would say, realistic proposals how to deal with these challenges. But I as I said, yeah, this is the problem with, with, with some people in the um, European Union who have too much of a power and too much of a veto um, opportunity and who can just block the entire process. Indeed. So we will want to finish our conversation about the way forward. What are the big strategies, democratic strategy, which is why it's so important and great that so many of you are on this call. Um, and indeed, questions are come, continue to come uh, on these challenges. So I'd like to turn to Nicolo um, to field some of the, of the questions that are coming. Danuta, can you stay with us to listen to this last round of question or do you need to? Yes. I just have four minutes. Right? Okay, okay, well, if okay. you want to say one last word before you go then, or, do you, or why don't, um, I would like to say something. Let me say something. Okay, because I, I also I was very proud of finally of our recommendations and this group on the Europe and the world because we we, we really find with found with citizens understanding that we, we we need all those things to happen and the unanimity uh, problem with unanimity uh, voting and with uh, ensuring that in the post world world there will be uh, really around the table that will be where we will define standards uh, global standards that the democracies will really prevent because those standards should be rooted in, in the European universal uh, values. But what I would like to say are two issues, actually. One is that my understanding has been now that when citizens say autonomy, they don't think like some of our colleagues about autarky or inward looking Europe, but they think about autonomy through cooperation, so resilience through cooperation. And this capacity of Europe to create global alliances, to be part of, of global um, a big group of democracies that is together and that cares about the world, that's absolutely fundamental. And to how to keep the second issue, how to keep citizens really involved and engaged in European uh, process, we unfortunately have to fight for certain institutionalization of citizens' participation. You cannot just ad hoc from time to time just convene them, but we have to have a, a system uh, for this. And there are some ideas. And the last thing, there will be a follow up uh, the 9th of May. I hope we'll also talk about the convention about the treaty change. We will have a meeting after summer again. So we European institutions will prove to the citizens that they take the recommendation seriously. So I'm hopeful now more than I was two years ago that this, uh, that this uh, conference, this biggest ever dialogue with citizens will have a follow up and will not and, and led to structure to the recommendations on which we basically all agree. And now we have to convince those that are still doubting, which is some of the member states. Danuta, it is uh, heartening to know that some of the institutional people, like you and Varela, who are MEPs, uh, are, have so close to their heart, you know, continued citizens' participation, not just in the current process, but if we have a convention, if we have a treaty change and all of that. So this is this is great to hear. Um, and now let, let me turn and thank you very much for being with us. I know you you have to leave. Um, uh, Nicolo, what are we what give us a gist of the many, many dozens of questions that are coming in? Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll read out two of them, which I think are good summaries of, of, of 
plenty of others. One from Gabriel Muller, how can we build a future in a really safe Europe where all European countries would be included on the basis of equality, democracy, and human rights? After this terrible war, is there still any possibility? And I think the term of human rights here is crucial, something that the European Union um, used to be uh, proud of and still uh, claims it's representing. And Mihain Bikiri has asked about whether the EU should accelerate the process of integration in the EU, in the EU for democratic Western Balkan countries that aim for peace. Um, rather than waiting for conflict to happen, wouldn't it be better to take those countries in now? Prevention is better than uh, fighting. So those are two questions. Two uh, broad but important questions, and I'd like to... Um, turn perhaps um, to hear uh, Martin de Groot, who uh, has been working very closely with the citizens ambassadors, um, to, to, if you can give us the gist of what um, they have said about these issues, um, including on the citizens dimension, then I want to turn back to, to Alphaz and uh, Martin. Hey everyone, um, it's very good to see you. Um, I will leave the two questions that Nicola just asked for, for the speakers to answer. That's not my role, but perhaps just one thing to mention based on following the, the working group EU in the world and also having been in touch with, with ambassadors in, in Strasbourg and, and in between plenary meetings. One thing that struck me also from, from observing the working group meetings is that the panel uh, EU in the world, um, that they came up with various recommendations also related to citizen participation and to transparency and to bridging the gap between the people in Brussels and Strasbourg in, in EU institutions um, and ordinary people living in Europe, basically. And what I also noticed is that they insisted on this being reflected in the work of the working group, um, where some politicians in particular in this working group wanted um, these recommendations to be forwarded to the other working group, the democracy working group, but for them, the issues related to democracy, related to inclusion, are at the very heart of, of their thinking about um, the EU's role in the world, which is, again, very much connected to, in that sense, to what Alfias raised with the EU's consistency internally as well as um, externally. So that's one thing I wanted to share based on my observations and interactions with, um, with ambassadors. It's a pity that they could not uh, ultimately join us today. Um, they have their own meetings. They also have a lot of meetings. So I think they have been a bit overwhelmed, especially at this final stage. But um, I hope that many of you have the chance to interact with them as well. And um, I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more about them um, in future events. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Martin. And indeed, it's, it's good to know that the citizens representatives are, are extremely busy conveying some of these important and rather transformative ideas. So now I just want to hear back from Alfias and your, your reaction to what you've heard and to the questions convey, conveyed by Niccolo. Yeah, first of all, I have to apologize. I, I'm very passionate. So sometimes... Uh, yeah, passionate is good. Alfias, we, like we're I'm, all I'm, passionate. Yes. It sounds like I'm very attacking, but I don't mean to be. Uh, and um, I do get, I start talking very quickly. So my apologies to the interpreters. Uh, thank you for the great moderation. Um, just before I come on to the two questions, I would just say that I think the EU needs to better explain what it does and, and how it works and how it functions. I think citizens just, you know, working in the parliament for eight years, it was very difficult to describe citizens, you know, what the different institutions do you know, what powers the MEPs have. And I think we've got a bet, we have to do a better job of explaining this to citizens. Um, we've got to move beyond the superficial. Um, I know uh, Danuta talked about European Citizens Initiative and other initiatives, but you know, what has come from the European Citizens Initiative? Not much. So, you know, we need to move away from super, superficial gestures to our constituents and actually move to, you know, real participatory models. Citizens Assembly, I saw someone write in, in the Q&A, I think Martin mentioned, you know, um, having, you know, citizens, you know, involved, you know, in, in regulating Frontex, you know, along with MEPs and stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I would say that, you know, Viola and Danuta are good examples of MEPs that are, I really think the MEPs are doing a great job. I think where my problem comes with is the civil service, and I don't think the civil service is fit for, for, for today. And I think there needs to be a rethink of how that civil service works. Very quickly, just on those two questions, I only have very quick points on them. On human rights, um, 
Yeah, it's difficult because I have a lot of, I, I do believe in the use force to be a, a great, a good actor in the world and, you know, a, a, a great soft power. But, you know, there are a lot of human rights violations happening. You know, uh, we talked about Frontex, but, you know, if we want to stick to these universal as European values, uh, Danuta said, then, you know, how do we explain pushbacks, you know, people drowning in the Mediterranean, you know, that's going against the, the conventions that we created, you know, globally, multilaterally. So, you know, if we want to be an advocate for human rights, we need to get our own house in order. And I think the problem right now is, is that we're not strong enough on, against those member states that are violating fundamental rights, you know, too much backsliding is going on. And this is where the parliament and full credit to Parliament has been really pushing the Commission and the member states and the Council to take firmer action against those member states that are backsliding. And you know, we're slowly seeing some movement, but if we really want to be a union of values and a union of equality and a union that you know is going to be a strong world player, then we need to get our own house in order. And then just the final thing on accession. I'm a little bit skeptical, you know. Um, we bring in countries now, so you know they don't they don't go into the sphere of Russia, or you know it's a way of uh, protecting these countries. But you know we had the, you know we've had significant access, uh, accession periods, you know, um, and we saw that you know in the past, and you know where are we today with that? Um, with you know, the, can you hear me? Yeah, no, no, I'm just reacting at his because of course. Um, even Ukraine, which is uh, who is now, of course, the candidate that we all champion, uh, will have a very long road. The Western vote, but many, however much in solidarity with Ukraine they may be in the Western Balkans, do feel that, well, they've been waiting for but a very, very, very long time. They've been waiting for 30 years since the war wall fell, and it's still not happened. So there is a really, can we really be? said to be a project fit for peace europe if we you know at our very in the western balkans you have countries that are much more vulnerable to russian influence chinese influence because the eu hasn't quite opened the door maybe for good reasons but it's a fact it is a challenge the western balkan huge challenge give you one quick word of yes but i want to i see the clock is ticking so i need to turn to martin and jola one last word I think that that's the question. I think that that is the 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 question we will have to deal with. That you know we don't want countries like Serbia to go into the sphere of Russia. We don't want other countries, you know, to be uh, influenced by China. And you know, the longer we don't accept these countries or bring them into the EU, the more that happens. But you know, we need to stick with our rigorous checks and procedures because we saw with the accession countries in two thousand and four that look where Poland and Hungary are today. You know, joining the EU doesn't necessarily negate you from, you know, joining, you know, being in the sphere of Russia or of China. Hungary is a great example of this. So, you know, for me, I think, you know, we have to be very, very insistent that, you know, the checks and balances are there and that, you know, the respect for fundamental rights are there. Otherwise we're going to have this dangerous backsliding that we're seeing. Um, and I, it's unfair just to say on Central, Central and Eastern Europe because it's happening all over the EU. But, you know, we have to make sure that any accession is done, not rushed, but, you know, is done in a way that, you know, ensures that these countries go in one direction. And that is, you know, in a positive direction rather than backsliding, as we see today, um, in particular with Hungary and Poland. You know, we don't want to repeat that just because we're in a rush to to. To, to reduce the influence of China and Russia. So I think it's a very difficult question because I don't think we should be rushing the process, but you know, how do we keep these countries on, on board with us or on our side, you know, whilst conducting all of these checks and stuff? Um, and that, uh, if we want to be fit for peace and use enlargement to do so, it's a balancing act. What we're starting to <laughs> understand after almost an hour and a half of, of, of conversation is that it, this is indeed always uh, always about difficult trade-offs there is no, no magic bullet in any of these conversations um and martin you know I, I, it was super interesting uh what you two just were discussing uh because i'm also like hesitant while i see the need for rapid uh, expansion we also have things like the copenhagen criteria and they're precious and um this balancing just for act, everybody I'm, oh yeah martin, they, who's they, listening they, these are the criteria that define whether a country is eligible 
to join the European Union or not on different indicators, democracy, rule of law, transparency, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, what I'm wondering is why there isn't a renaissance of the discussion of the two-speed uh, union, basically having young member states coming in easier, faster under the security umbrella of the EU, and those young member states like Western Balkan states, like Ukraine, wouldn't have full rights yet. Maybe they would have a different position within the council, da da da, however you construct this. But basically, building them a path towards full membership already under the umbrella, but being like a young member state. And that at the same time gives the old member states or the established ones you know, this, um, they, they need to stay stable because if the core gets unstable, then no one, that serves no one. So I'm really wondering why there isn't more discussion about this two speed option and um, creating this young membership status, having less rights and possibilities, but still under the um, security umbrella of the EU. Martin, it's interesting you use the word young in a very different way that we've used it earlier. Young, a young candidate, a young member. And we've been talking about a Europe with different speeds, different status for a very long time. But perhaps with the Ukraine war and the prospect of bringing in also Moldavia, Georgia, they've also applied in, in the wake of, of Ukraine, uh, we need to be much more imaginative in the way in which Europe can integrate countries at mm -hmm. different pace in different ways. Um, and, and maybe even good old UK, where Afias is speaking from, could uh, be part of that story, part of a new story. Um, that's a very positive thing we could take out of, the, of, the, of this terrible, terrible war. Um, but of course, some countries might not like to be treated like kids. Um, so we also have the young people, the young people who are the citizens of Europe, and I, I hope we can kind of circle back to, to this um, great challenge of changing Europe so that it really is fit for peace, that in part this challenge means that young people are front and center in that story, including, including they were in the Conference on the Future of Europe, including in participation, including in campaigns for citizens uh, initiative in all sorts of ways. We need more young voices and participation in Europe. I, I have no doubt about this, whether, whether I'm thinking of my students, my kids, all the young people I know. And, um, and so Europe should be part of schools, not just to tell young people what they should think, but they should do Europe. They should do democracy in their schools. So Viola, please give us your last word and then we'll give the very last word to Nicolo. Um, um, on everything you've heard and where you, how you see moving forward, strategy to make all this happen. Uh, big question in a, in a few words. Well, the connection is, the connection is becoming very bad here. Maybe that's the European Parliament's problem or it's on your side, I don't know, uh, but it's pretty much interrupted, which is a good sign to leave uh, while I have the next meeting in two minutes. Um, well, to be honest, I mean, the last question what Martin has, has touched upon, um, I'm a little bit critical. I wish we could have, we called it two days ago at the European, uh, at the College of Europe at the Balkan Week, the pre and post accession challenges. And what we would need is like a continuity mechanism that this is not, um, how to say, um, a sad, thing that you are forever in the European Union if you do not comply and if you do not align with the EU acquis. I would rather like to see an, an option that, I mean, a state, a country such as Hungary is not really worth talking about it. How much resources we spend on thinking of how to get Hungary back on track. I wish what we could do is really to suspend that for a time. I mean, if they decide to go a different path, okay, they are welcome. I mean, why should we spend our resources, our engagement, our staff on giving them money, which is mainly used 
for staying in power, creating a, a non-democratic system, which is almost impossible to crack, obviously, even with this, uh, with the last elections and with a quite, a, I mean, approach which you normally find in autocratic states where the entire opposition uh, um, gathers behind one uh, candidate and so on. So, I mean, and we spoke on this on this panel two days ago with uh, somebody from the DG Justice who is on this side of what can we do, what kind of justice instruments do we develop, can we develop to get Hungary back on track. And it's, of course, not just Hungary. I mean, we spoke about Poland. In some cases, it's Slovenia, it's other cases. And I wish we, I mean, this Copenhagen criteria, we need a continuously monitoring oversight mechanism, which would make it possible that for a certain uh, period of time, those countries could, could be kicked out with all the rights they have. Um, and, and for example, the Ukrainian friends today said, no, we don't want a two, um, how do you call it, Martin? A two speed, like two, a, yeah, two level? Two speed union. Two like speed a, union. Mm -hmm. if, if we want to join, I mean, we really would like to fulfill all the criteria. We want to have a full, uh, full fledged membership and not just an observing standard or not just the uh, domestic market and not just this and that. And now, I mean, I have been to Bulgaria. They are not member of the Schengen zone. They are not member of the Eurozone. They are still, there is still something what they need to achieve. And nevertheless, they have a huge corruption problem. Even in this case, where they are not, let's say, a full-fledged member in all uh, the EU policies, we cannot make them complying completely to our standards. Um, and so I have no recipe. I, I'm just sometimes lost when I see the full picture of the of the European Union, the um, diversity, which is of course one one hand nice, but it's quite a challenge and is rather frustrating if you want to set this level of uh, equal social standards, environmental standards, anti-corruption standards, rule of law, of course, and so on. And I see in some countries we have quite lost a lot of time uh, while we have not worked on, on instrument how to how to deal with the violation of this fundamental rights. So, and that's and coming back to Martin with the last sentence, that's why I'm very much on the side of a merit-based process and not too much on this geopolitical approach when inviting uh, uh, new members. I know it's hard, it's tough. But when it comes to the Western Balkans, I know they can do it. They are small and this is a lot of political will, but we have to support the right political actors in those countries and not the old corrupt elite. And in most of the cases, we have been supporting the old corrupt elite and this will not work. Um, indeed, Violan, these are strong words. You may not agree completely with Martin, but I, I, I very much believe and hope that everyone who's been listening to all of you um, is a bit le less lost. You said you're lost. Well, <laughs> I think you were loud and clear. And, um, and we've heard some very important and provocative uh, proposals, which now Nicola will take one minute to um, summarize. Well, that's an impossible task, Nicolo, but uh, to, to say a closing remark, and then I'll say goodbye. And I will leave. Sorry for this. Thank you. Yola, thank Bye, you Viola. very much for being with us. And Nicolo, okay. what, have we, what have we heard? We've heard a lot, but I think we've above all heard that if there was any doubt, history is clearly back and history is accelerating. That's the, that's the bad news. But the good news perhaps is that uh, history is not just something that's happening to us. It's something that citizens are reflecting about, talking with each other about, and even through the Conference on the Future of Europe with all of its imperfections, citizens have their foot in the door of the institutions which are actually taking the decisions about these things. We heard about the irreducible complexity of all of these problems, the ways different issues overlap with each other, interlink with each other, and how there's no perfect solutions or perfect actors. And so in that kind of situation, surely 
it's our collective intelligence that we have to rely on to find a path through. Uh, but perhaps the big challenge we've got to be aware of is that um, because history is working very quickly, we also need to be able to take decisive action quickly uh, and not rest all the time in our hesitations and our deliberations. And I note uh, in this regard that hopefully, um, it's hopeful to observe that in the Conference on the Future of Europe, it's often been the citizens that are pushing for the clearest recommendations, the strongest recommendations, pushing back against the politicians and pushing for the most decisive action. That's what the citizens have been doing. And in particular, the youngest citizens who have been part of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So here's coming to what Calypso said, uh, some faith and power for the youngest uh, citizens who see very clearly, they always have done, they've lived their whole life in a state of urgency uh, and um, are willing to take often decisive action um, about it. So collective intelligence is what we have been uh, experiencing today through this call. It's not the first call of this great coalition um, that's been putting together the Power to the People series, and it certainly won't be the last. Uh, we heard that on the 9th of May, the conclusions of this conference on the future of Europe will be public. The leaders will start to say what they're going to do about it. And there'll be plenty of space for us to reflect and react, but also to take our responsibility as citizens in this uh, complex world to deliberate together and come uh, to our own strategies. Faithful that we've got representatives, people in the civil service, civil society organizations, and others who are going to help us to amplify our voices. So that was my best attempt to summarize Calypso. Thank you, Nicolo, and for taking time off from the wonderful Porto Festival uh, organized by the Citizens Take Over Europe Coalition uh, back there. And a thank you to all of you who are with us still at this late hour and to all of the organizations that have contributed to this event. Um, and of course, to our speakers who are still here, uh, Martin and Alfias, um, I'd like to simply say that, as Nicolo just said, this is ce n'est qu'un au revoir, as we say in my country, we will be back with Power to the People, a series um, that is there for all of you and for all of us, the people of Europe. On this, have a good evening. <laughs>